at some point I have to stop introducing these videos as welcoming myself back because it's time. Time I really jump back into YouTube after taking the past year to focus on work with my students and to just cope with the pandemic. And that's what I want to talk about today in today's video. Coming back to your work and to the things that make you happy. One of the hardest things this past year was being in a place where it was simply hard to get anything done. And I realized I wasn't alone in that. A lot of my friends and students talked about the same thing. Burnout is something we all go through at some point, but there's nothing like being stuck inside for an entire year to get everyone on the same schedule of feeling burnt out or uninspired for a lot of the time. So today I want to share with you a painting that helped me break out of burnout and get back in touch with what inspires me and talk about how you can either get out of burnout or help prevent it from happening. To kick off, I suppose I should ask, what is burnout or art block? In my experience, feeling burnt out or blocked tends to feel like depression. You feel nothing, but you also feel overwhelmed at the prospect of doing anything. You have no drive to work, and the work doesn't excite you. As far as the difference between block and burnout go, if you feel blocked, it may be a short-term feeling that happens around a specific project. But if you're burnt out, you may have trouble feeling any motivation to paint at all, or difficulty translating that desire into actually doing the work and getting joy out of it. I see this talked about a lot for artists working in animation, comics, concept art, and illustration. Places where your creativity has to be really high because you're always creating out of nothing to a certain extent. But I haven't seen it talked about for fine artists and realist painters specifically, and that doesn't mean it doesn't happen and happen often. Mastering realism or diving headlong into an atelier program, those are things that are primed to create art block and burnout in their own way, and I don't see enough artists talking about it. Instead of feeling like you're out of ideas, like you might if you're working as an artist in the industry, what I find to be really common with painting and mastering realism is that you encounter this gap between your eye and your hand. Your taste has advanced more quickly than your skill has because skills simply take more time to catch up. So getting better means you actually feel like you're getting worse sometimes. Awful, right? <laughs> I'm gonna put up a quick diagram of what we think learning looks like when we're trying to become the best painters we can be. The horizontal line in this graph represents our taste or where we want to be. And the line that's going up at an angle is our skill. This is how we just unconsciously expect learning to work. Even if we know better, <laughs> this is what our brains think should be happening. Now, the first problem with this graph is that we don't learn linearly. That's the reason why we talk about a learning curve versus a learning line. So really, our rate of learning looks more like this. The second problem is that the more we learn, the more nuanced our taste becomes. So instead, maybe we adjust our expectations and envision this sort of graph. Our taste grows, but it can only get so much better, so it grows slower than our rate of learning does, and eventually we catch up. But it isn't really this simple either, because we tend to learn and develop in these sorts of ebbs and flows where we have a breakthrough applied over the course of a bunch of paintings and then plateau until we reach the next breakthrough. And something similar tends to happen with our taste as well. So the result looks something like this. What I love about this graph is that it highlights something that I think trips us all up a ton. Because of the ways these sine waves interact, there are periods in here where we actually think we are getting worse at our craft despite getting better. 
So what's really happening is that our taste is growing while our skill is plateauing. And we sense that gap increasing and wrongly intuit that it means that we are regressing. As a side note, I found this graph over at Shattered Earth's DeviantArt page, who based it on a blog post by Mark D'Alessio. The previous hand-drawn graph on the skill and taste gap is from a post by Raya on Twitter. I'm linking all three graphs in the description, and I highly suggest you check them out, study them, and internalize the insights they have to offer. All right, enough graphs. <laughs> I know you all are here for painting, um, not for an algebra lesson. So knowing what these graphs have to offer may not be able to help you bust out of creative block on their own, but I found that it's an important first step in keeping us encouraged and motivated. Speaking of motivation, with my students, I often talk about how we learn most effectively and improve most efficiently. And I've realized that this can actually invite us to fall into a pretty nasty trap. If your sole focus all of the time is getting better, you will feel stuck in a place where you are constantly not good enough. And I say that in air quotes. I'm sorry, you can't see the air quotes. So sometimes we need to make things that are right at or below our current skill level, not just beyond our grasp. We need to make things that are fun to make and fun to look at that make us feel like our skills are enough right now as they are, so that we aren't constantly defining ourselves by all the goals that we want to hit that we haven't yet achieved. And I know this sounds simple, but it isn't that simple a thing, and it is really important. Just as learning to improve effectively is a skill, learning to sit down and guarantee you'll have a fun time painting, that is a skill too. It's something I omitted in my own work for a long time and something I was seeing happen for my students too. So now we have a culture that is just as committed to enjoying painting as it is to improving and meeting our goals because you cannot have one without the other. So... What else helps prevent burnout or help you recover? First, I would ask what support structures you have in place. Who helps inspire you? What routines keep you in a good mood? Who can you talk to when you're having a rough time? These aren't crutches. These are systems that help you rebound more quickly and relapse less often. This painting that I'm sharing on screen was a demo I made exclusively for my online students. I set a date, told everyone what to expect, told myself I was gonna have to sit down and paint, and I painted it in real time in front of them, asking their questions as I went with the expectation that I would finish the painting in that session so that they could witness the entire process start to finish. Having that accountability and the support of other artists keeping me company made this painting possible. So if you need your own support group, I would highly recommend that you do whatever you have to do to make that happen. Or if you'd like to join my group of artists, I have a link in the description so that you can do that as well. The next thing I'd ask is what coping skills have you developed? Here are some examples of the coping skills I found most helpful, but if you have something that works great for you and isn't in this list, I hope you'll post them in the comments. The first two skills are from Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, which is a fantastic resource to help you get to creating if you're having trouble. The first item I have here is morning pages, which in short is journaling first thing in the day or before you start a creative session. And it is three unfiltered, uninterrupted pages of just stream of consciousness. It doesn't have to be about creativity. It doesn't have to be about the painting you want to do. It doesn't have to be about anything at all. In fact, it doesn't have to follow any format at all. You just have to keep going until you fill the three pages. A lot of times when I do this, it takes the form of lists or number crunching or doing some business planning or analyzing a painting that I'm stuck on. Um, and I don't necessarily have a goal. I just know that I need to put something down. And there is something really cathartic about this process. And if you're having trouble painting or having a good time painting, 
if you do this consistently enough, your morning pages will probably tell you what the problem is and how you can fix it. The tool that I want to recommend is taking artist dates. Um, this is another thing from the artist way, as I mentioned, and it is the idea that taking time outside of the studio to get together with other creative people or people who just inspire you creatively and doing something that gets the creative juices flowing that is not specifically work is really valuable. Um, in my opinion, artist dates are a shortcut to inspiration. And even if they don't necessarily inspire something directly, they are supposed to be fun and they're supposed to get you in a headspace where creating feels easier. Next, I have some general skills related to improving and maintaining your mental health, which is a big one this year. And even once we're out of all of this and things feel back to normal, I find that most painters I talk to really struggle to pay attention to these things and keep them up. So the first thing I'm going to suggest if you feel burnt out is therapy. There is no substitute to having somebody to process what you're going through with you and give you some guidance, um, especially if there are other things going on in your life. And a lot of the time that we feel blocked or burnt out, those things are there and processing through them, working through them, it can make a really big difference in terms of being able to sit down and feel joy creating. Next up is mindfulness, which can similarly help you get back to a more regulated emotional state. Um, and just like mindfulness, uh, we have physical activity, which, I mean, I know anecdotally, we probably all know that going out for a walk before we paint can help us feel more centered and maybe more energized to do creative work. Um, but both of these things go hand in hand in terms of getting us to a place where we just feel grounded and I don't know if like happy or at peace are necessarily the right terms, but there are certainly steps on the way to that experience. This next one <laughs> probably goes without saying, but if you're anything like me, this was a real struggle this year, and that is eating nourishing foods, drinking plenty of water, and just trying to be kind to your body um, in addition to your mind. You know, before this, I mentioned physical activity, and I kind of talked about it in terms of the mental benefits that it gives us. Um, and there has been a lot of research showing that physical activity can have a really profound impact on your mental and emotional well-being. Obviously, the same is true for your physical well-being. And it's amazing how much these physical things can actually change our minds and make it easier to do these creative things that take a lot out of us mentally and emotionally. And finally, I have connecting to a community of artists or just friends who inspire you. It's really hard to do any of this alone. I think a lot of us have found that to be true over the past year. Um, I know that was certainly true for creating this painting. I don't know how long it would have taken me to make this on my own, but having other people to share the process with, having you all to make this video for, it makes a really big difference. And whether you want to create your own community of artists and find a set time that you get together and paint together or just talk about art, or you want to find another community to join that can do that for you, none of this matters without people. And I think it's hard to get to a creative place without people. Um, so I know this is kind of snuck into the middle of the list here, but I think this might be one of the most important things that I could say. All right. And finally, I have a few miscellaneous tools that can also make a really big difference. The first is feeling connected to why you do this, whether, you know, whether you paint because you want to have a certain impact or you want to give back to a community or 
you just want to achieve something with your painting or you want to feel connected to something when you paint or you want to celebrate certain people or certain things in the world and share that with others, really tapping into that reason can make a really big difference. Next, I would say finding a way to take a really hard look at evidence of your growth um, surrounding your craft. It's really easy to take these small breakthroughs for granted and creating a habit of paying attention for any little thing that was easier today than it was yesterday or that you were able to do in this painting that you've never been able to do before. Or maybe it's just a painting where, you know, you've, you've experienced these little wins before but never had all of these wins come together on a single painting or a single project. Those things really make a difference. I find that practicing gratitude generally helps open our eyes to these things. Um, so a gratitude practice is another item that I think is a really great tool. Um, but just make sure that every time something goes really well in your painting, you aren't diminishing it. You aren't downplaying it. You aren't overlooking it. You are celebrating it. All right. And that is <laughs> at least my list as it stands today. Now, even as I look at this, I ask, why do all of these things? Well, first of all, you don't need to do all of these things to help create burnout resilience. But the more tools you have in the toolbox and the more you're comfortable using, the better. Because the reality is, is that anyone you see who is an absolute amazing painter probably made more failed paintings than you ever have. So don't think that getting better relieves you of the anxiety around not being good enough. It doesn't, unfortunately. So you'd better start practicing these things now so that they don't trip you up down the road. All right, so what about the painting practice itself? Here are some ideas that you can use to mix it up, get out of a rut, and hopefully just have more fun when you sit down to paint. The first is doing studies. These are low stakes ways to just feel like you've done something and build forward momentum. I find that's really helpful for a lot of people. Most of the time where we get stuck isn't halfway through a painting or even starting a painting, it's getting into the studio. So if you have a project that's there, that's waiting for you, and it has a low barrier to entry like doing a study, I have a feeling that's going to make a pretty big impact for a lot of us. So one study exercise would be to grab an anatomy book and do copies of the anatomical structures of the human form, or even if you have an anatomy book on animals or anything else. Um, those are really simple ways to really advance your understanding of what you're painting in a way that doesn't require that much brain power or that much time investment. Um, and it certainly feels low stakes because these are just places for you to learn, not places for you to get something perfect or, you know, make a painting that's going to sell. Another study you could do would be master studies. So doing copies of master paintings to try and understand um, the process and thinking that some of your favorite artists employ to make the kinds of work that they do. And then the third study idea that I have down here is to go outside for some plein air color studies. I find that when painting outside, usually the light and the environment changes so quickly, especially at certain times of day when the light is really striking, that I don't really have the opportunity to get precious or kind of anxious about what I'm able to make. I know that at maximum, at certain times of day, I might have 15 minutes before the light changes and the image is just completely different and it makes more sense to just start over on a new painting. So having that really short window for working, I think can have a profound impact. And I think there is simply something really connective and restorative about being out in nature that I don't want to discount here. The other suggestion I would have besides studies would be to play in a new medium that you are not trying to be great at. So 
on this channel, you see me working in oil all the time. I think there's something to be said for going out and using gouache or working in charcoal, maybe. Um, I find that charcoal can maybe be like very close to oil and it's easy for me to take charcoal a bit too seriously, but I'm not trying to be a great gouache painter. So taking out the gouache set can be a way for me to just loosen up and have fun and relax because there are no stakes when working in that medium. And I'd really love to hear from you all. What do you do if you just need to have fun on a painting? How do you guarantee that happens? I think this is a place where we could all really benefit from sharing with one another. And as I go ahead and add my signature to this painting, this is it. I hope if you are feeling the way that I felt that this video has been a help to you. And I would love to hear about the paintings that you've made that have felt like breakthroughs just like this one. For everyone who is new here, welcome. Thank you so much for subscribing. And I hope that if this is the first video you're watching, that you enjoy this and want to subscribe and stick around as well.